But thank you so much um, for joining us uh, today, Heather. I know that you have an extremely busy schedule. You are at a conference, you are speaking, um, you are triple engaged. Um, then you have um, an election going on, um, a campaign going on. There are so many uh, policies which have to be put onto the ground. Um, and then the Germans come around the corner and want to hear from you all about Bidenomics and how it works and uh, what you do better than us. So thank you so much for joining us um, and give Heather a big applause for being here today. So Heather is a, a member of uh, President Biden's Council of Economic um, Advisors. And um, Heather, before we start and I hand over to you um, for your introductory remarks, maybe you can tell us what is the Council of Economic Advisors? <laughs> So the, the, the Council of Economic Advisors was founded in 19, as a part of the 1946 Full Employment Act. It created this advisory group for the president to advise him on economic policy issues. That same law also created a somewhat similar group in Congress called the Joint Economic Committee that advises Congress about economic and economic policy issues. But here at the Council of Economic Advisors, we have about 40, 45 um, staff, and most of them are economists from universities and from government all across um, the country and all across different agencies to um, advise the president on some of the most pressing economic issues. And in fact, um, this week, we are releasing our this year's um, economic report of the president, which is required by law that we produce each year. So, Heather, you are one of the most vocal and known voices um, in the United States um, on um, inclusive growth. And you have been doing, I mean, uh, from an academic point of view, but also from a practical point of view. Um, what were your first thoughts when President Biden asked you to join his council? Oh, I was, <laughs> I was absolutely thrilled. Um, I had been working with him on the campaign. I was a part of the transition. And the ideas that the president had, how he wanted to, to use his words, change the paradigm about how we thought about economic growth and how we made um, equity a core part of that, um, was just so exciting to be able to be a part of that team and to join his administration. And you're just still as excited as in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, this president has accomplished amazing things. Um, you know, the last Congress was one of the most productive in generations, um, able to pass legislation in a bipartisan way, but also when he needed to, just with Democrats, um, that are that just game changing legislation for the United States. And I mean, that's really what I want to talk about with you all today, the American Rescue Plan, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, and of course the bipartisan infrastructure law that are really reshaping um, the federal government's involvement in the U.S. economy and to a lot of strong effects. We're already seeing uh, in so many ways how this has created an economy that has been more resilient, stronger, and um, seen robust job gains for Americans all across the United States. And with this, I hand over to you, um, and we are very much looking forward to hearing more about what you just said. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Emma, so much. I'm so excited um, to be able to be a part of this conversation here today. Um, thank you um, to the audience. And I apologize that I can't be with you in person. Um, I'm in Paris um, at the OECD um, uh, talking economics here. Um, so thank you for your indulgence. So let me get right down to it. Uh, when the president came into office, uh, we were facing a series of economic crises, just like um, countries all around the world. Of course, we were facing the pandemic and the ensuing recession. But the, but the president also knew that there were a series of longstanding economic challenges, one of which was just referred to the longstanding challenge of inequality. You know, the United States has had over half a century of rising economic inequality across a variety of axes, leaving our um, economy um, more fragile and our society more vulnerable. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, we had the existential cli crisis of climate change, which the United States had not been able to make the kind of steps that we knew we needed to make um, on that important and pressing issue. And then you add to that that during the pandemic, one of the things we learned was that, um, or one of the things that we all saw was how fragile our global supply chains were. 
while some folks, you know, scholars have been studying this, it really came into full view that um, global supply chains were much more fragile and that this was putting, uh, making our economy vulnerable. So in light of these challenges, the president during the campaign laid out a vision to not just build back from the pandemic, to build our economy back from that recession, but to, in his words, build it back better. So he paired um, the short-term challenges of the pandemic and the recession with these longer-term challenges around equity, climate change, um, economic resiliency. And um, he knew that we would not be able to do this alone. So that's the theme of what I want to say this, this, um, say this afternoon. So he did this through passing three, um, uh, or actually four, really important pieces of historic legislation, which I will just again briefly outline. Um, first, of course, is the economic recovery through the American Rescue Plan. You know, the United States has now had an unemployment rate below 4% for a whopping 25 months in a row. That is a longer, longest stretch in time going back over half a century. That is an enormous accomplishment. And we got that unemployment rate down far faster than forecasters were predicting because of the bold and decisive actions that the president took. But that American Rescue Plan was also a down payment on longer term economic change. And through the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is making foundational investments in infrastructure all across the United States, much of which has been um, too long overdue. Um, on top of that, we have these capacity and expanding sector-based investments in semiconductors and, of course, in clean energy through the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. These are designed to enhance um, our productive capacity and to make sure that we are encouraging the private sector to invest in the things that we need the most, um, to be on the cutting edge of new technologies, and so importantly, to build a clean energy economy that'll benefit not just those of us across the United States, but around the world, and to use our power and our resources to be able to make that change. So there are three pillars of Bidenomics, and um, I just wanna emphasize, and I'll just briefly mention what each of those are. The first is that we're investing in America. So that's those four pieces of game-changing legislation. It's investments that are happening all across the United States. And I do want to just emphasize that it is our view that it is not a choice at this moment whether to invest in clean energy. We know that there are enormous gaps in the amount of resources that need to be invested in clean energy on the public level, but also from the private sector if we're going to meet our um, a zero emissions goals, if we're going to meet our climate targets. And so a, a key part of the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and also to some extent the other laws, is to crowd in that private investment. Um, in order to be able to um, push those technologies forward and um, lower costs for these technologies across the board. So again, not just for the United States, but for but uh, around the world. And we do that, um, this again, this first pillar of binomics, investing in America. We are making these investments on both the supply and the demand side. So I think it's really important as we've been thinking about our modern American industrial strategy, it isn't just one tool. It is a host of tools from the um, across the innovation to commercialization pipeline um, and on both supply and demand. So um, we are in incentivizing the on the supply side by investing in goods that have strong positive externalities. We are sending clear demand signals with consumer facing tax credits um, and using the government's purchasing power to change what government is buying because um, uh, the United States is such an important player in so many markets. We are solving market failures that include coordination um, problems across complementary investments. For example, there's excellent research out there now showing that consumers, one of the reasons consumers are wary of making the switch to electric vehicles is because they don't see charging um, a charging network out there. So the government is stepping in and making those investments in that charging network alongside helping um, those companies that are making the cars make that transition to producing batteries and electric vehicles and then on top of helping consumers purchase those and make them more affordable. It's now the case that electric vehicles in the United States are um, about on par and may even start to be lower than the cost of internal combustion engine vehicles. And we do all of this through um, unlocking private capital, 
reducing credit risk through demonstration projects, loans, loan guarantees to to um, to build that bridge to bankability so that firms can be successful on these cutting edge technologies. And um, the benefit of all of this it is, it is that it is able to crowd in private investment through what we call our government enabled private sector led approach. Um, you know, our estimates, um, and these are from about a year ago, um, but our estimates are that this um, this pathway that we've chosen, the Inflation Reduction Act, could lower global um, clean energy costs by about um, 25% for some technologies, benefiting not just the United States, but um, everyone around the world um, through being able to afford these um, uh, easier. Let me briefly go through the other two pillars, and then I want to give you a couple of, um, of success stories. So the second pillar of Bidenomics is that we are empowering and educating workers. And throughout our modern American industrial strategy and throughout our investments in infrastructure, we are doing so with an eye to creating good jobs, to um, encouraging the formation um, where workers want it of unions. This is the most pro-union president, certainly in my lifetime here in the United States, the only president to go to a picket line um, in, uh, in, the, in the historical record. Um, but throughout our policies, we are focused on making sure that workers have the skills and uh, have access to the skills and training they need through partnering with businesses, especially in cutting edge technologies, um, to make sure that they are communicating what those skills that they need are and making sure that we are creating good jobs. Those companies that get tax credits for making investments, they get a bump up, they get a bonus if they make those investments in ways that pay higher wages or use um, what in our country we call registered apprenticeships. I know we've learned a lot from the Germans um, on apprenticeship programs. Um, so that is a really important piece of the puzzle. And one of our one of the president's goals from day one, he did a day one executive order around equity and has been committed to leaving no community behind. And so part of these investments in empowering and educating workers is making sure that we're utilizing place-based policies um, commitments to help communities that have been too long left behind or might be at risk of being left behind, a focus on energy communities, on um, what we call Justice 40 communities, communities that have been um, left behind in terms of economic and environmental justice, and really focusing on regional hubs. So, um, so that is the second pillar of Bidenomics. Then the third pillar of Bidenomics, so we're investing in America, we're empowering and educating workers, and we're making sure that we do so in ways where markets are fair and competitive. Now, I'm an economist, and I really like this third pillar, and I feel like we don't talk about it enough um, because it's it's thinking deeply about how markets work. You know, the United States was one of the um, world leaders over you know a century and a half ago of putting in place um, what is called antitrust legislation, legislation to break up monopolies to make sure that markets were competitive. But in, um, in recent decades, in the latter half of the 20th century, there was less and less enforcement of those, um, of those principles. And we saw a rising economic concentration across the US economy. And part of the president's commitment has been to make sure that we are thinking about competition, that we are making sure that markets are fair and competitive, and that's benefiting consumers, but also benefiting small businesses and also benefiting workers. There's been a lot of research done in recent decades about how economic concentration leads to worse outcomes for workers. They, they are paid less. They don't have as many options. And so the president has made a real commitment to this and a specific commitment in his industrial policy to focus on those competition issues. So, for example, um, for the very first time, the U.S. government released guidance to agencies as they are putting together rules and regulations how to do so with an eye to thinking about market structure and competition issues on the front end, rather than just um, waiting for the antitrust um, legal authorities, the Department of Justice or the, um, the Federal Trade Commission coming in after the fact to break up monopolies, uh, monopolies. really thinking about that in a forward leaning way. Um, and that has also been um, really important as we've thought about, again, going back to uh, the example of electric vehicles, as we thought about the charging networks, how do we make sure that those markets um, have clear standards, they're open, they're fair, and we're not putting our thumb on the dial of any one or thumb uh, on the scale for any one particular uh, firm. So those are the three pillars of Bidenomics, investing in America, empowering and ed educating workers, making sure that markets are fair and competitive. 
And we've been doing all of this with a with an eye to um, making sure that we are focused on our partners and allies, thinking about how we can create more resiliency across our supply chains through um, what we have called and others have called friendshoring, and to really focus on those positive economic spillovers um, from the um, from these investments on the global economy to drive down the cost of clean energy and also to work together to create new global supply chains that can be resilient and um, and and effective for all of us. And so having given you the briefest of rundowns of what we're doing on Bidenomics, let me spend a few moments going over um, some of my favorite success stories. Um, so if I was going to show you a bunch of slides, I would show you just a bunch of just jaw-droppingly awesome slides. So let me see if I can describe them to you uh, here um, so you get a sense of just how impressive this economic recovery has been and the strength of what the president has been building for the future. So first, as I already noted, um, we got the unemployment rate down far faster than forecasters expected, and we've been able to keep the unemployment rate below 4%. There were also moments in 2023 where the gap in the unemployment rate between the state in the United States with the highest unemployment rate and the lowest unemployment rate hit a record low. It's really important to the president because that means that we are growing more evenly. It means that no state was um, dis as disproportionately left behind as, as happened in prior economic recoveries. Um, on the president's watch, we've created almost 15 million jobs. And we've had three years of record applications to start new businesses. That is a signal of optimism and hope in the U.S. economy. People are saying, I want to start a new business. I'm going to get out there and do that. And um, year after year, we've seen these numbers go up, up all across the country. Um, so that is, um, th those are signs of strength. We've also seen wages outpacing inflation for the better part of a year now. Um, and wage gains continue to be strong um, for those at the bottom end um, of the labor market. Of course, like our like our friends and allies and people around the world, we have seen this um, relatively high inflation. We have been able to get that pace of inflation to come back down. Um, it is not where we need it to be. We know that we still have more work to do. The president talks about this, but that is an important um, uh, it coming that trend coming down is certainly an important accomplishment. The second set of accomplishments are around our investments. Um, one of the things that um, we've been able to see is a skyrocketing increase in the investment of new, in the construction of new manufacturing facilities across the United States, um, in um, uh, particularly around um, the production of electronics. So that has increased by over 100%. Um, and it is contributing, it is now contributing more to U.S. economic growth than at any point going back um, to the 1950s. So that is an indication of what's to come. We're making the, we're, we are growing our economy by making this investment in these new structures, and then those jobs and that um, productivity enhancements will come over time. We have seen um, uh, over 40,000 new infrastructure projects announced all across the country in communities um, like covering, if I were to show you a map, it's covered in little dots. This is happening all across the country, and we're seeing those investments in new roads, um, new access to broadband, um, people getting uh, pipes and going to their home that don't have lead, so we're not poisoning our children, um, making sure that every community has sewers, and a whole bunch of other investments, including in the grid. We've also seen um, across the country um, investments totaling almost $650 billion, I think it's $649 billion the last time I looked, in private sector investments in semiconductors, clean energy, electric vehicles, manufacturing. Um, and one of the things that's really important about those investments is that they, too, are happening all across the country and consistent with the president's commitment to leave no community behind, those investments, those private sector investments that have been induced by the public dollars are disproportionately going to communities that need it most. They're going to communities where the, the majority of people who live there are disproportionately don't have a college degree. It's going to lower income communities. So that is, again, another testament to this place-based policies. Um, the way that the president has been thinking about his industrial strategy as a place-based policy is showing fruit already. They were seeing these gains across the country, not just in some parts, not just in urban parts, um, but all across the United States. And um, 
So that is um, that is my whirlwind tour of Bidenomics that I wanted to take you on today. Um, I think I've hit all the high points that I wanted to touch on. Um, I, I want to emphasize one last point before I let you um, uh, uh, ask me some questions, <laughs> um, and that is that you know the president came into office with with a plan, a plan to reshape the U.S. economy, a plan to not just build back from the pandemic, but to build back better. And a plan that would allow the United States to play the role that we need to be playing to make the investments, to build um, with our with our partners around the world, to build a clean energy economy and to make sure that we have access to cutting edge technologies that are so important to our economic growth and stability. Um, And it's exciting to see early indications of the success of this, the strong economic growth we've seen, but also this robust investment that will hopefully benefit um, us for decades to come. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much. So Heather, I don't know if you saw that, but I made a face a couple of times looking up at the ceiling. That was not because of your statement, but because we lost the video for a second. We were able to listen to you for the whole time, but for a few seconds, we couldn't see your picture. And that's why I was um, trying to signal we have to get her back. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, I, um, I, I do have to admit, I would love to have you all by myself asking you a lot of questions, but I will share you with the audience immediately immediately, because I know that they do have um, a lot of questions, um, and um, it is not so often that we have the opportunity to actually talk um, with somebody so close to the president, um, giving him advice on a daily basis, and just a few days before your big economic uh, report comes out. So, as I said, I'm going to share her with you. So, who would like to come in immediately with a question? Maybe we can collect a couple of them, and then I hand it back uh, again to Heather. And now, don't be shy, you know. Yeah, Daniel, please. And if you would stand up and not look at me, but look at the camera so so Heather can see you. (laughs) Oh, do we have the mic? There it comes. Yeah, we need the mic, otherwise we can't hear um, our audience, online audience can't hear us. Thank you. Um, hi, Heather. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm an economist and a lawyer. And uh, I want to express appreciation for the very structured way you've allowed us um, to gain insight in a split second in, uh, in what is going on. Um, we tend to, uh, you know, look transatlantic these days. Um, but, you know, looking transatlantic forces us to try to understand what our transatlantic friends uh, are doing trans-Pacific and how they look trans-Pacific. Because I think, at least from the distance, there is some potential changes in the policy coming up subtly, uh, sometimes more boldly. But can you help us to understand priorities and focus trans-Pacific and what it means for transatlantic? Heather, thank you. Thank you so much. And there's one up here. Was it Molly? No. Annika? Oh, then I hand over. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Okay. I'm facing backwards up. Where, where's the camera? Oh, hi. <laughs> thank you very much. Hi. My name is Brittany Walters. Um, I'm with the Brunswick Group. And so, apropos, I have a communications question. Um, I know that the Biden administration is doing a great job. And when I speak to my family, what I hear is a lack of understanding for these economic policies. And I feel like that's been reflected in some of the coverage of late, that if you ask Americans, they feel like they're not doing better, even though they are markedly doing better. So I was just wondering how you're thinking about communicating that in light of the the campaign season kicking off and um, how we're moving forward in 2024 with the way that we communicate that message. Um, We, me, being part of the Biden administration. What I meant is, as a Democrat, (laughs) Um, and I look forward to hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, please. In the back wall. Exactly. Uh, hi, Heather. Uh, my name is Tashar. Uh, I work with the Diplomat Magazine in DC. 
Uh, my question had to do with, you mentioned um, friend shoring, and uh, here we've had a lot of discussions about how to align our investment and economic policy for private companies with the security policies uh, and incentivize, sorry, incentivize uh, private companies to align with that further. I just want to ask what measures have your uh, government taken uh, to try and encourage friend shoring and investment in friendly countries uh, amongst the private sector? Because that does seem to be a big question mark here in Germany. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I was just um, signaled by the team, Heather, that I totally went off script because we did not discuss with your team that I would include the audience. And I hope it is okay. <laughs> I'll answer what I can. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. And with this, I hand uh, back to you again. Yes. Um, these are great questions. And I'll, I'll kind of, I'm, I'm going to pull my answers together. Um, Listen, I think that, you know, one of the most important things, and um, uh, I think the administration has been, you know, very clear that, you know, we are focused on making sure that our economy is um, it's strong, it's equitable, it's resilient. And, you know, from my perspective as an economist, when you look out and you think about, well, what are some of the challenges that we face, um, uh, the resiliency of global supply chains and what those, those are going to look like in the future is certainly a, a, a front and center issue. So when you ask about how we're thinking about friend shoring or working with allies and, and our relationship with the Pacific, um, you know, making sure that we have stable and resilient um, uh, supply chains is a, is a core goal. Um, and one of the things that we know is that, and this is, you know, I went over the three pillars of, of Bidenomics, investing, in America, empowering and educating workers, and that markets are fair and competitive. And in core parts of the clean energy supply chains, they are um, heavily dominated um, by one country. And that is um, that lead, that creates a, a potential lack of resiliency, real. Um, in, in many cases, all, we're seeing real indications of that in, 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 in some ways already, um, and creates challenges. And so one of the things that we are focused on is making sure that that we all have access to the things that are so important that we need. Um, you know, we are also making sure that for national security reasons, along with all of the cutting edge technology reasons, that we are making these game changing investments in uh, uh, semiconductors so that we are able to have a more uh, resilient global supply of the things that we think matter the most. We all saw what happened during the um, lack of supply of semiconductors, of course, during the pandemic is one example, but of course, there are national security issues there as well. I would say on the issue of understanding, um, this is a question that we get a lot, and um, I would say a couple of things. Um, first, you know, when you look at polls, um, uh, Americans are highly favorable of the specifics of what the president has put in place. Everything from reducing the price of insulin um, for seniors to negotiating with prescription, um, in negotiating over prescription drug prices with drug companies, the big pharma, um, to you know cutting costs through a whole host of of um, ways, including addressing junk fees, to the investments that we're making in infrastructure around the country, um, and the investments that we're making in many of the aspects of the clean energy economy. I think one of the challenges is that when you throw all of these things together in big pieces of legislation, um, I, I don't expect that my mom or, or Americans are, are tracking all the names of different things. But we do know that when people see, oh, this is what he's doing, this is what he stands for, you see time and time again that the polls are highly favorable. And in many cases, um, along those uh, uh, around those specifics on a bipartisan basis. Um, one of the things, though, is that and I, I mean, I will say it this way. We came out of a global pandemic. It was very challenging to people all across the country, all across the world, right? People had someone in their family die. It was very scary. Their lives were up upended. We also know now that millions of Americans changed their jobs. Some of them, you know, upskilled their jobs. Some of them are starting new businesses. Millions of them also bought new homes. All of these things are um, maybe exciting and fun, but they also are, make people feel a little insecure. And then, of course, on top of that, we had an economic narrative about a year and a half, two years ago that started to develop that, wow, there was no way that we were going to get through 2023 without a recession. And every news story, for, I felt like for a year, every time I went on television, it was like, when's the recession going to happen? When's the recession going to happen? And we were like, well, actually, we've put a lot of um, resources in place. We put in a lot of policies and we don't think we're going to see a recession. And in fact, this has been the strongest economic recovery 
um, out of any recession in um, in decades, certainly over my professional career, decades going back um, uh, many, many years. And um, the hard thing, though, is that that's not the way that it was teed up for, for many, many months, years um, in the media. And now I think as we're looking at that in the rearview mirror and saying, oh, actually, growth was quite robust and we have been able to get um, the pace of inflation down. I think people are starting to realize that we've actually had a number of months now of consumer confidence going up. And again, people are very favorable about the specifics. And now um, all of these new investments that we're making, they take time. Um, and this, I think, also has an international component as well. These investments aren't they um, they aren't going to happen overnight. It takes time to develop the um, uh, uh, not just the investment in a single factory, but in that new, new ecosystem around it, in those new supply chains that it needs. There's a lot of like uh, new challenges when you're building real things and um, helping people see what that looks like in their community, what those investments look like. That's you know, what what my colleagues, the president, the cabinet officials and myself, what we are all doing each and every day to go out and communicate that to people. It's one of the reasons I wanted to be able to make time to talk to you all today is to talk about what our economic vision is. And um, and we need you all to um, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, to also help us communicate this to the public who may feel a little anxious or nervous um, about these big changes that are happening um, in their life that may make them feel a little insecure. But I think what this president tries to say every day is that he has a plan and he has been putting in place policies that are benefiting the American people and are creating greater economic security and, in his words, building the economy from the middle out. Thank you very, very much. We know that you have to go and we will let you go in just a second. But maybe you can tell us, because we had quite a few OECD representatives with us over the course of the last two days, and also WTO representatives and some others. What are you actually doing at the OECD in Paris right now? Um, actually, today, um, I, I, I'm here with the team um, uh, Uh, sort of focused on the micro issues, the the working party one, and we're actually having a retreat to talk about what this what this group um, at the OECD should be prioritizing. Um, they have been prioritizing issues around AI and climate change and green jobs and housing and um, competitiveness issues. It's a wonderful, rich agenda. We're going to spend the next two days talking about it, and then importantly, tomorrow we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about industrial policy. Mm. Um, uh, and, you know, and the really important role that economists and experts at the OECD play in helping us understand this toolbox that we are using to build a clean energy economy um, and what that means around the world and how we can think about measuring economic success. Well, thank you so very, very much. And also for being such a good sport um, for going off um, the, uh, the, the pre-discussed line <laughs> of this event. Thank you so much. And next time, we would love to have you here whenever you uh, decide that you want to go to Paris and not just to Paris, but also make the diversion via Berlin. And I always say Berlin might not be as pretty as Paris, but we are really exciting. Um, so <laughs> um, <laughs> let us know. We would love to have you. Um, and some of us, um, apart from doing our work at Aspen or at policy making or in the business community are also teaching. Um, and I know that you are a great role model um, for lots of lots of uh, us uh, in the teaching world and we would love to have you as a role model also to our students. So please let us know. <laughs> oh, Stormy, thank you so much. That's so, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's so um, that, that wonderful. Thank you so much. And with us, we let you go and have, well, Good luck for all the uh, discussions at the OECD. Thank you.